This week on the show, we have Paralympian Jamal Hill. Jamal was ranked number one in the U.S. Paralympic 50-meter freestyle and number three in the world. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for watching. This show is all about giving you insights and showcasing brands that help you to live your best life and give you confidence. As always, I want to kickstart your morning with some motivational advice to help you to feel inspired and energized to start your day. Today, I want to talk about the importance of understanding that the way people treat you in your relationships is often a reflection of the beliefs you have about yourself. Have you ever heard the analogy that life is like a mirror? Well, this statement couldn't be more true. Think of life as a mirror, reflecting your subconscious thoughts and beliefs back to you in the form of your relationships. Here's an example. Have you ever noticed that people with healthy relationships often have a great relationship with themselves first? meaning their mindset is aligned with feelings of worthiness, confidence, and high value. On the contrary, the people that have toxic relationships often have feelings of unworthiness, unconfidence, neediness, or low self-worth. When we compare the two, it becomes evident that having a great relationship with others and how we are treated boils down to having a great relationship with yourself first. Like a mirror, when we have a great relationship with ourselves, and view ourselves in a capable, confident, and loving light, we attract others who reflect those beliefs back to us. Make it your mission today to start treating yourself more kindly and lovingly, and watch how fast the people in your life will match those beliefs right back to you in how they treat you. As Ernest Holmes quotes, life is like a mirror and will reflect back to the thinker what he thinks into it. Stay tuned. Coming up after the break, you're number one in the U.S. for Paralympic 50 free and three in the world. So, I mean, you know, with all the barriers you went through, how does it feel having that title on a personal level? Um, <laughs> Amazing. I, you know, just on a personal level, just very vague, right? It's a dream come true, quite yeah. literally. I was at a swim meet this past weekend. Uh, you know, with swimming, you just, uh, I'm able to go to a lot of meets, whether professional or amateur, I was at an amateur meet, and it was interesting, I was in the locker room, it's a Sunday evening, and, uh, you know, some guys are saying, dang, this meet is going on so long, I still got to go to work tomorrow, and in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm at work right now, right, so, yeah. <laughs> there's just that level of, obviously, there's a dream come true element and aspect to it, uh, but there's also just, um, there's also, I think, just like a, an even more deep call to responsibility now, right? It's like uh, when I was, I don't know, I dropped out of college at 2016 to go try and become a professional swimmer. Uh, 21, 22 years old, moved back into my parents' house. I'm laying in my bed, I got this crazy dream. I'm looking up at the ceiling and I'm saying, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm a spiritual guy, uh, big faith. I'm talking to God, I'm making a deal with God. I said, hey God, look, I got this crazy dream. I'm unknown, I'm unranked. There's no reason in the world why I should become one of the best swimmers in the world, uh, but I'm gonna do my part, I do my work. If we can make this a reality, I promise, you know, to ultimately be more than just a swimmer, right? Ultimately, you know, I'm ultimately making a commitment to place these tenements, these core principles and values that I feel like I've gained through faith on display for the world with my new platform to really lead by example. So. Wardrobe provided by H&M. Next on the show, we have American Paralympic athlete Jamal Hill. Jamal represented the United States as Team USA at the 2020 Summer Paralympics. In addition, he was ranked number one in the U.S. Paralympic 50-meter freestyle and number three in the world. Jamal, thank you so much for being on the show today. How are you doing? I'm doing excellent, Ms. Roy. Appreciate you having me today. I'm really excited to talk to you. You have an amazing story of resilience um, and triumph. So I want to, before we talk about all of your accomplishments, let's talk about um, the beginning. I know at just 10 years old, uh, you were diagnosed with um, a condition called CMT. So, mm -hmm. so tell us about that and how it affected your body. Yeah, absolutely. So CMT is an acronym for Charcot Marie Tooth. It's the uh, official name of a neurological disease that plagues me and about one in twelve hundred Americans. Um, <clears throat> like you said, I was diagnosed. It, I was diagnosed with it in ten years old. Uh, when it first onset, it put me into a paralyzed state. So pretty much, well, quite literally, right? Everything from my neck below was paralyzed. I wasn't able to move. Uh, I could talk. I could bobble my head, you know, how I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. But arms, legs, 
my brain just wasn't able to communicate with him. So in this most inflamed state, that's how it manifests in my body. Uh, but day to day life, uh, you know, when, when things are not inflamed, it pretty much feels like I'm walking on my kneecaps. So from my kneecaps to the soles of my feet, I have 0% nerve capacity. And from my elbows to my fingertips, I have about 30% nerve capacity. So, you know, I definitely, I mean, I know none of us try and text in bed with the phone over our face, but I especially avoid it. And I know you had a passion for swimming at a very young age. Mm -hmm. So tell us about how the diagnosis kind of affected your swimming. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's actually pretty strange, you know, so the diagnosis ultimately took me out of swimming. So I was a swimmer from, I don't know, before one years old, mommy oh. was in classes all the way up until I was 10, you know, swim lessons to swim team. Uh, and it was just kind of one of those things. I think kids who are fortunate enough to be put into, you know, sports or or uh, any type of math and science or anything to just kind of stretch you, put you in a social atmosphere. If you like it as a kid, you know, uh, you usually kind of stick with it, especially if you're good at it. So that's what swimming was for me up until I had this diagnosis. And uh, that diagnosis came with a few other complications. And so ultimately the doctors kind of said, well, it's just too dangerous for you to continue swimming. This is gonna cause other health complications. And uh, yeah, that, that's how it affected my swimming. It caused me to stop swimming at 10 years old. Wow, and I know through faith and determination, you regained mobility, which is miraculous. So, so tell us about that um, and how it happens. Yeah, uh, I think, right, faith, faith and resilience 100%, but you gotta understand, I come from a, I come from like just a strong stock, right? Like strong bloodline, really proud family. Uh, just like really, just, I don't even know how else to say it, just a really proud family, so it's like, I was always, I was always just inundated with this mindset of there is really no such thing as giving up. There is really no such thing as being defeated. There is really no such thing as someone else putting a limit on you, right? Like life is too short for any of that stuff. Uh, my parents were both very, I think, ambitious people, um, both athletes, uh, and just again, yeah, both had overcome a whole lot in their lives. You know, have made a lot of mistakes. I had the privilege of having older parents. You know, so I got a lot of wisdom at a young age as a result of that. You know, that and, and the spheres of influence that they were also connected with. So I think just from an early age, and especially as we were going through this thing as a family with the disease, it just kind of kept, it just kind of kept coming up, kept coming up. You know, ultimately, there's no book that's going to define what Jamal Hill can and can't do, right? This is what this book says, this disease should happen. You shouldn't be able to walk, you shouldn't be able to this, you shouldn't be able to that, you shouldn't be able to this. And uh, yeah, pretty much we just choose not to believe in things that take away our personal power. And that was something that was instituted in me from a child. So I literally chose not to believe in things <laughs> that take away my personal power to this day. It has some good, it has some bad, right? Everything has duality. But ultimately, you know, that's where that strong faith comes from. That's where that resilient mindset comes from. Uh, and I think that's where a lot of my internal strength and just like restlessness a little bit, you know, unwillingness to just accept, oh, this is it. This is this is the this is the crappy hand. And I guess it's just what I have to deal with. I love that. I think that's the biggest takeaway from your story is your resilience because, you know, I created this platform to inspire people and to show that anything is possible through determination and your mindset. That's really what my show is about is helping people create a winning mindset and you showcase that and you're the epitome of that, which that's what I really like about your story. And it really touches me because you know, no one should put limits on themselves because we are limitless human beings, right? The sky's really the limit, so I love that. And fast forward today, you're number one in the U.S. for Paralympic 50 free and three in the world. So, I mean, you know, with all the barriers you went through, how does it feel having that title on a personal level? <laughs> um, <laughs> Amazing. I, you know, just on a personal level, just very vague, right? It's a dream come true, quite yeah. literally. I was at a swim meet this past weekend, uh, you know, with swimming, you just, I'm able to go to a lot of meets, whether professional or amateur, I was at an amateur meet, and it was interesting, I was in the locker room, it's a Sunday evening, and, uh, you know, some guys are saying, dang, this meet is going on so long, I still got to go to work tomorrow, 
And in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm at work right now, right? So yeah. <laughs> there's just that level of, obviously there's a dream come true element and aspect to it. Uh, but there's also just, um, there's also, I think just like a, a even more deep call to responsibility now, right? It's like uh, when I was, I don't know, I dropped out of college at 2016 to go try and become a professional swimmer, uh, 21, 22 years old, moved back into my parents' house. I'm laying in my bed. I got this crazy dream. I'm looking up at the ceiling and I'm saying, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm a spiritual guy, a big faith. I'm talking to God. I'm making a deal with God. I said, hey, God, look, I got this crazy dream. I'm unknown. I'm unranked. There's no reason in the world why I should become one of the best swimmers in the world. Uh, but I'm going to do my part. I do my work. If we can make this a reality, I promise, you know, to ultimately be more than just a swimmer, right? Ultimately, you know, I'm ultimately making a commitment to place these tenements, these core principles and values that I feel like I've gained through faith on display for the world with my new platform to really lead by example. So now being number one in the U.S. I'm, for the 53 for a number of events, you know, I'm pretty much taking over the U.S. record book at this point. Uh, but also, you know, world rankings and things like that, winning Paralympic medals, winning champ world championship medals. All that just comes back down to building my platform, building my stage, opening doors and opportunities for me to come and to speak with lovely hosts like yourself to really push what my true value and what I feel like my true purpose is. And that is to live a purpose filled life. That is to ultimately say on record that the measure of a champion is not how fast you can swim or how high you can jump, how, how, how fast you can run, how much weights you can lift. It's not, it's not about, you know, thinking 5, 10, 15 moves ahead on a chessboard. That's not what makes the champion the trophies and the medals. What makes the champion is what you stand for. What makes the champion is what you teach people. What makes the champion is how you lead by example off of the court, out of the pool. You know, that, that's a very, very limited perspective on life. And um, I think, quite frankly, I think that's one of the biggest problems with our society. I think that's one of the biggest problems is that we tout champions as people who just have this athletic prowess when that's a very limited, valuable, but very limited dimension and aspect of a holistic life. Absolutely, it's, it's what you do with your platform, right? And you're using your platform to inspire. We're gonna get into that in a little bit, but you know, I wanna talk about, we talked about faith and I wanna talk about, you know, healing your body and having your diagnosis. You know, it, I'm, it's not easy. So what helped you to not lose faith and to keep going during difficult times? Cause I'm sure there were difficult times. Number one, most important thing, if you're gonna do something crazy, I'll say it again, is you gotta commit to being crazy yourself. Yeah. Uh, after that, I would just say, <clears throat> you know, I'm a guy that kind of lives my life one quote at a time. Uh, so one of my favorite quotes is, dude, time is moving no matter what. Mm -hmm. Five years from now, I could sit right here uh, in my studio on this sofa and not accomplish anything. Five years will have still passed and that's it, right? Time is always moving. Uh, I'm a firm believer in I have less time to be alive now than I did yesterday, right? The, the clock is always winding down. So when I was deciding to go be a pro swimmer, even younger, right, is I'm trying to learn how to walk. I'm struggling with uh, identity, right? Disability identity, trying to blend in, wanting to be the same. It always kept really coming back down to, okay, well, do I want to live with regret or not? Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much the governing agent in my life. Do I want to live with regret? Yes, uh, I could not walk i cannot try to walk again maybe walking will put me in a wheelchair well if a wheelchair is coming anyway why am i just trying to run out and meet and let me try and walk oh well what if you drop out of college and nothing works you you don't make it to be a pro swimmer well that's very possible 100 percent. but i'll tell you this i won't be sitting here 10 years from now saying oh dang that was a crazy idea too late now yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. no I'll be sitting here saying, oh, yeah, well, that did or did not work. And this is my life now because life moves on. We pivot, we grow, we learn, we move on. So I think that's the biggest thing, you know, it's just understanding that life is is a compilation. And it's again, these are things that we all know, but it's so easy to give ourselves excuses to like let life happening govern the choices that we make. Uh, and that's something that 100 percent I do not endorse or condone. So. So you just got to take a stand. You got to say what you're willing to do, what you're not willing to do. Uh, you got to get out there. You got to go after what you want. I think the crazier, the better. The This world has 
trust me, it's got enough rules. It's got enough limitations. We need more people willing to test the limits, more people willing to maximize their spirits and their dreams, um, more people willing to be afraid to move through, you know, courageous actions. Uh, that's that's it, man. You know, it's, it's, it's really not rocket science. I got to say, I'm like, the only thing that's rocket science is rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah. listening I was listening to a podcast yesterday and it was about the law of assumption and how we always assume the worst thing over the best. If we have two options, we like our minds are trained to think, <clears throat> what if I fail rather than what if I win and it's better than I ever dreamed of? And I think that's so important that you said that is that, you know, instead of looking at the negative, you the what if was all on the positive side and that's how you overcame obstacles. And I think that's a another great uh, nugget of information for our, our viewers to take away from is don't think what if I fail think what if I win and it's better than ever and it has been for you let's talk about representing team USA um how was that whole experience for you because I'm sure it was a a dream <laughs> yeah for sure it was uh it wasn't is a dream right I'm still an active Paralympic athlete um wasn't is a dream you know obviously again just from a national perspective it's lovely to be able to represent team USA to be able to represent my country um, you know, to be able to stand arms in arms uh, with countrymen. I think Team USA is the one thing that all Americans pretty much agree on. Like, hey, yes, go Team USA. We're all behind this. Uh, so that's a lovely feeling. Obviously, it goes without saying that the pride and honor to be able to represent not only my country, but actually myself, people that I know, people that have built me and helped me to build myself, have put me in this position. Uh, that has a lot more intrinsic value to me. Uh, and then, you know, as we take it into that mic macrocosm of, okay, what does it mean to represent Team USA in the scope of the world, right? Because we do live in this global economy. Everyone's always watching. Um, I'm sure that I inspire just as many kids uh, in the US as I do in Mexico, as I do in India, um, as I do in Japan, just because we're all so connected. So I think just to be able to, again, stand for something uh and, and and proudly stand by that is actually very very rare nowadays and when you have an opportunity to live in that truth and, and to broadcast it um yeah it just I, I don't even know it's not even if i can say it maybe let me, maybe let me say it like this right uh, I, I was i had the privilege of winning a paralympic medal last year in tokyo and to this day, right, don't get me wrong, that's a huge honor, and, and I love it. I love it so much. But that medal that I won in Tokyo, right, more or less the height of my career at that point, right now, that medal is sitting right next to all the other medals I've ever won in my life. Mm -hmm. It's just sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. what medals do. <laughs> that's yeah. What, that's what they do. You know what I'm saying? Like, that, that cannot be the value right that you bring to the world that can't be the value that you identify your own self-worth with um so obviously working at that level comes with a lot of pressure or it can come with a lot of pressure and uh, i think this just would be a viable place to a little bit of caveat anyone who is living their dream anyone who is dealing with a lot of pressure in any workspace environment maybe it's a family environment one thing that always helps ground me number one is having a strong team I'm very vocal. I let my team know, hey, I'm feeling anxious as hell right now. I'm so scared. I'm this, I'm that. And I talk to them because bottling that stuff up is not going to allow you to be your best. It's not going to allow you to live in your truth. So my team and I, we have a very transparent relationship. I trust them. That's why they are my team. Uh, so it's important that you have a team, whether that's family, coaches, whatever it may be, people who are going to be able to support you, right? Yeah. We're going to be able because you're going to come up against the dragon. And if it's your first ever dragon dude, you're going to be scared. It's just how it is. You're going to be afraid. Yeah. So you're going to need somebody to lean on because you still got to get out there and do it yourself no matter what. Uh, and then secondarily, I would just say is that when I'm in those moments, uh, I really take the time to remind myself that, wow, I'm literally backstage right now of the biggest competition in the world. I'm one of eight people about to walk onto this stage and do what I love. Mm -hmm. Dude, I'm already won. I'm mm -hmm. already a winner. Like, I'm already, this is a dream come true already. What more could I want? Let me go ahead and just put a big old smile on the inside and <laughs> give some glory. Let me give some thankfulness to God. Because a few years ago, then I was in my parents' house. 
mm-hmm. trying to make a deal, right? <laughs> here we are now. So that's the biggest thing. It's like, again, emotions are going to come 100% lean on your team. But when you're in that moment, as best as you can, be present and be grateful because that moment is going to be over in a flash. Everything is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Mm-hmm. And you know, the one thing that really sticks out about you is of course you're extremely talented and, and good at what you do, but I find the people that are really successful are the ones that have the biggest and the greatest mindset, right? So I want to talk about, I know that you have 14 hour days um, or 14 hour weeks training, but I know you also have a performance coach which um, helps you with your mindset, which I thought was very interesting. So let's talk about the mind body connection and performance and swimming as well together. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my performance coach, my mental performance coach, Wilma Wong, she's, you know, she, her, her main title is mental performance coach, but she's really kind of an everything coach. Uh, she's a friend, she's a life coach, she's, you know, a partner in this swimming venture, um, a student of the sport, so many amazing things. Uh, and we've been working together now since 2022, 2017, so what's that, five years? Uh, and we've built a relationship. So. <clears throat> I think the most viable thing when it comes to that mental performance is for Wilma and for myself and I think for anyone out there, it's the art of realizing that you don't know anything. Mm. Uh, My mental performance coach is literally the greatest student that I know. She's constantly looking for new ways, um, studying the best in the world to help me become the best in the world, right? Uh, so it was through my mental performance coach that I was introduced to meditation, that I was introduced to visualization. Um, it's through my mental performance coach that I was really pushed and supported to ultimately right, uh, launch multiple businesses even outside of my just competitive swimming career. Um, things to keep me active, things to keep me inspired, things to keep me committed always representing new challenges uh, and a lot of that just comes to framing so uh you know on our teams we have the saying like nothing is ever hard right we don't give anything the power of being hard or easy um possible or impossible we just say this is a new challenge right and the new challenge is just a way of saying it's a new opportunity this is challenging i've set this goal and it's challenging uh but i can get it so that's really my two cents on on mental performance my two cents on wilma um, I think at the at the foundation of anything that's going to be truly fruitful uh, in coaching or anything like that is going to be the integrity and the strength of the relationship. It's going to be the amount of trust that you have in yourself as an athlete or, you know, as more or less a contractor. And uh, that's going to be reflected in the trust that you have on your coach, you know. So whether or not I agree with what Wilma says, a lot of times I just do it because why the heck else did I bring her in here if I wasn't at least... <laughs> Try, right? Yeah. I mean, hey, your mindset dictates your whole life. So I like that, that you're working on meditation, visualization. I mean, those are things that I practice as well. And it helps me a lot to stay focused. So I like that. And I like another thing I like <coughs> that you said is about being a, te- uh, being a student, you know, being a student in life, because at the end of the day, the people that think they know everything, they don't go far because they think they know everything. Whereas the ones that are constantly learning and growing and saying, you know what, I need to keep growing. Uh, even if they reached, you know, their goal, they keep going and they keep, you know, they keep pushing. So I like that you said that. Absolutely. Well, I got this, I got a firm belief. The most unsuccessful people also know the most. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. I want to talk about, we talked about, you know, using your platform to inspire. So let's talk about the Swim Uphill Foundation. And mm-hmm. I know it's saving lives. So let's talk about your passion for that. Yeah, absolutely. So the Swim Uphill Foundation uh, is a love child of mine. Uh, I was officially founded in 2020. We've been doing that work since 2018, though. Our mission is to teach 1 million people around the world how to swim every single year. Uh, originally, the mission was just to teach a million people, uh, but right around 2019, 2020, we were having so much success, the mission had to evolve, right? So that's that's when you know you're on the right track. When you set a goal that you think is big and it starts to become so plausible that you're like, okay, man, we got to scale this goal up a little bit. Uh, so ultimately, again, like I said, we're working to teach a million people around the world how to swim every single year. Uh, we focus on low and middle income communities worldwide. These are usually communities that are obviously plagued with financial resource limitations, access limitations to calm bodies of water, access limitations to, you know, uh, essential coaching. 
um, and also time constraints, right? A lot of these families are so busy in the matrix, in the rat race, just trying to stay afloat that they buy into the misconception that swimming is a luxury, that mm -hmm. learning to swim is an option, that learning to swim should be something only for the elites. Uh, when in reality, learning to swim is one of the greatest confidence boosters that a human being can experience, let alone a child or adult, any human being, learning to swim is the greatest confidence booster that they can achieve, right? So obviously drowning is its own thing, but when we talk about just everyday life, when we talk about the impact individuals can have on the world and the communities around them, that's one of the reasons why I drill this so hard. Our curriculum meets people where they are. Uh, across a five hour curriculum, ultimately, we're able to pretty much start teaching people how to swim from their home as long as they have access to internet uh, and they have access to clean drinking water. We use household items to teach them how to breathe, we teach them how to time a stroke, uh, and then they come into that swim uphill family and ultimately evolve into a competent swimmer, which opens up a myriad of doors and opportunities, as I said, the most important one being, I thought this was impossible for me. I thought I could not do this, and now here I am doing this. Uh, it can't be understated how overwhelmingly empowering that is for the human spirit and mind. I love that. I love that you're giving back and that you're passionate about it. I, I think that's incredible. And speaking about impossible, for someone that's watching that yeah. is, you know, going through <clears throat> a tough time and just like not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. They're putting in the work, they're just not seeing results. Or maybe they're just going through mental health problems, whatever it is for them. What would you say to uplift and inspire them? Yeah, I would give them, I would give them a couple things. I'll give you guys a couple things here. Uh, number one, if you feel like you're going super hard and you've been putting in the time, you know, at least six months doing everything you can, uh, I'm not here to tell you that it is or is not the right thing, but sometimes you got to understand that like, you may not be in alignment. You may actually just not be working at the right thing. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of businesses and ventures that I'm a guy that always goes 100%. Just don't know any other way to do it. Mm -hmm. That I just found myself running into a wall, running into a wall, running into a wall. And I had to step back, just reassess my own values. What do I like? What do I enjoy? Am I actually doing something that is bringing like wealth to myself in ways other than money. If the answers are no, that could be part of the problem. Secondarily, you know, uh, encountering just like mental health, encountering mental challenges, right? That's ultimately what is any physical challenge, right? Or internal challenges is reflected in our minds. The most empowering thing I can tell you to do is go do something you think is impossible right now. Like you need to just build some momentum. You, you may think it's impossible. I don't know. You may think it's impossible for you to run a mile. Right now, you need to start working towards running a mile. As a matter of fact, you don't even need to start working towards it. You need to just go out right now and you need to go put in a mile. I don't care if it takes you 35 minutes to do it. You need to go understand that you can do things that you believe are impossible because they are not. Yes, uh, yes. That is the biggest thing that I would put to anyone. It's just like, whatever you think you can't do, the sooner you can just go ahead and do one of those things, oh, oh my God, wow, I can't, you know, I can work out once a day. And as we all know, obviously, physical fitness is a huge determinant, a huge impact on mental health. Now, that's not to say that athletes don't deal with mental health issues at all. Absolutely not. But, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're um, ultimately, like, if you're a lethargic individual, I think, like, a lot of times there's people who are less active that suffer the most from mental health. So obviously get active, take care of yourself, have this holistic perspective, understand that you're not alone in this, um, but also understand that you are the only one who can make this choice, that it's gonna be hard. Uh, again, my name is Jamal Hill. I'll tell you guys a little insight to my life right now. Every single day, <clears throat> I have a schedule. I have things that I wanna do, and attached to these things, I have two columns, right? I have two envelopes. And one envelope, this is my rewards envelope. Okay, and another envelope, this is my punishments envelope. <laughs> yeah, just like a child, you're still a child and you need to learn how to establish, ultimately what we're talking about here is discipline, right? You need to learn how to establish rewards and consequences for your actions and for your choices that you enforce on yourself. That is so important that you enforce on yourself. Me personally, 
there's a cheesecake sitting in my refrigerator at home. When I do something that I said I'm going to do, and I get through all these things, I'm not a big desserts guy, but I do, I will, trust me, I will give it up for some cheesecake. <laughs> I go home, I open the fridge, I dice up my berries and da 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 and I sprinkle it on my cheesecake and I sit down and I enjoy that slice of cheesecake. Now, when I don't do what I say I'm gonna do, when I don't maybe do that extra hour workout or something, <clears throat> oh, I've, I've got a punishment in place. There is no such thing as making it up in my camp. The next day, this is what you gotta do. You gotta go and run for an hour straight. It is painful, I hate running. Um, it also is probably just not the best thing to do for my neuropathy which makes it a very strong deterrent. Listen, I don't act up at school because I know when I come home, Papa's going to have that belt and I'm going to get a whooping. <laughs> I don't want that. So take yourself back to childhood and keep it simple. Rewards and consequences for everything. The more you can hold yourself accountable, the better and more enriching life you will enjoy. I like that. I like that you have that list because I think that's a really good way to to build discipline. I mean, some people are disciplined, some people are not. I know for myself, I, I'm i a pretty disciplined person. If I say I'm gonna do something, I have to, or I just I, I just don't feel good. I have to, you know, I have to see it through to the end. But, I mean, that's something that I developed over time, but I like that, that list for someone that doesn't have that discipline to, you know, to reward themselves. And also, if they don't do it, they, you know, they should, you know, <laughs> you know, like also d discipline themselves. You know, I, I like that. I like that you said that. I think that's a and If I may just like kind of piggyback off of that, one thing, well, I think one of the most valuable aspects for having this, again, rewards, consequences mode is that a lot of people, right, will, uh, let's say they set that goal for themselves. Right now, you're a disciplined individual, so ultimately, through practice, you are going to accomplish it, right? But for someone who is really struggling with this, who is new to this concept, they set the goal, they don't do it, <clears throat> and then guess what? Because of the shame and the guilt and the feeling bad, the pity ultimately for not doing it, now we're into a deeper depression. Now we're into a deeper, darker place to where now I really can't get anything done. The beautiful thing about having those consequences, again, I love to use the analogy as my parent, I grew up in a different generation, so you know this may not hit, hit everyone's home, but like after I got in trouble and I got that whooping, it was all over with. There was never, there was like, you know, me and my dad, we hug, you know what I'm saying? Obviously I'm crying, I'm upset, it was painful, but it's like, it's dead now. There's no need to continue to feel shame. There's no need to continue to feel pity. There's no, it's in the past, it's already happened. Now the next consequence, whether that be positive or negative, will come from your next choice in action, right? Mm -hmm. So by having these, if I don't do this, this is what happens, it allows you which I think is huge, to let go of the pity, let go of the shame. Okay, I did it, I did the crime, I did the time, fresh start, let's go. Mm -hmm. And I, I think another good way to reward yourself is something as simple as just saying, I'm proud of myself. When I do things that I didn't wanna do in my day or I pushed myself to do it, I tell myself, I'm proud of myself. Like, I, I did this, like, I'm the best. And I tell myself, and that, burst of adrenaline makes me want to do more because I like feeling I'm proud of myself. Me saying that to myself makes me want to do more and accomplish more. So I, I think that's a good way to reward yourself is just by acknowledging that you're actually doing it, you know? <laughs> something really powerful right there and, and it's an opportunity that I cannot let pass by. I speak to a lot of young men. I do a lot of leadership um, and one of the core tenements that I give to young men around the world is affirmations and self-talk. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, not, not to, to ultimately just to add on to what you said, I'm a firm believer in that you talking to yourself and you having ultimately a mantra that you memorize, right? I have a five paragraph mantra of self that I recite every single morning that I recite before any challenge. It's in me. I know it from back and forth. It's very empowering statements about myself, very empowering statements about my future, very empowering statements, even about my own insecurity, the places that I feel like I'm lacking. So that is something that is a reward that you should constantly give to yourself every day before, after, and during any challenge. I think that is probably one of the most non-negotiable aspects to an individual who is seeking a uh, more bountiful, mental health, uh, more bountiful physical health, and more bountiful financial health, and more bountiful family health is to continue to feed yourself with the information 
that you wish to be fed because otherwise we already know everyone is being, everyone's trying to feed you all the time. Everyone wants your attention. Everyone wants your mind. And 100% of the time they want what's yours, you know, to promote what they want for themselves. Uh, so you really need to take responsibility for your own mind, your own heart, your own spirit, your own beliefs. And the best way to do that is by drilling it day in and day out. Mm -hmm. I love affirmations. I also have an affirmation list that I say every single morning. And what it does is it trains the subconscious, right? Because at the end of the day, it's our subconscious mind that needs those affirmations. And, and that's how, you know, we program our mind for success. So I love that. Jamal, what are you currently working on right <laughs> now? What else is in store for you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like Brescia just because I'm always working on a bunch of projects. Uh, at this point in time in the foundation, uh, we're working on a, um, a school tour in the new year. We're working with uh, the governors from each state. So ultimately, we're going to be looking to visit immediately 150 schools in Southern California. Uh, we're going to be gifting them uh, swim education books to second to fourth graders, speaking to them, providing them with lots of tools uh, and, and gifts from our sponsors. That's gonna then move nationwide, like I said, with our partnership between the United Nations and the governors of each state. Obviously it's election season, so this is really a wonderful time for these governors to make a great opening contribution to their communities. Uh, outside of that, um, working on an animated film, a short animated film that's gonna launch probably in the spring of next year. We're gonna take it on the film circuit. It uh, definitely, it uses my life up until 10 years old as a vehicle to explain really relatable circumstances, right? Explain really things from swim education to family life to believing in yourself. Uh, it's a really lovely project. I'm excited about that. Got a new book dropping in the spring of next year uh, called Overcome Your Fear and Learn to Swim Uphill. It's ultimately the Swim Uphill Method wrapped in context of um, historical references regarding swim education, uh, challenges that people of color have faced. And again, ultimately a key in there to help you learn how to swim throughout the book. Uh, like I said, there, there's a lot of things going on in my camp right now. I'm really, really excited just uh, to continue to push through the end of the year. And obviously also I'm always in the water. So I've got my eyes on a few more American records, hoping to break 10 more American records before the end of the year. We're just, we're going all in right now. There, there's just, I don't know. I sprained my ankle two days ago and uh, I just don't know how to stop. Uh, there's just no other way to say it. I just don't know how to stop. Wow. Well, take care of your ankle and congratulations on all your success, Jamal. It's, it's incredible what you've done. <clears throat> Continue to be a beacon of light because, you know, you really are an inspiration. So thank you so much for chatting with me today and coming on the show. Absolutely, Dario. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for having me. It's a wonderful platform. Love what you're doing, providing inspiring stories. Uh, obviously, you're in Canada, I'm in the U.S., so this is uh, an international, right, soon to be, if not already, intercontinental program. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to inspire some of your listeners. Tag TV is available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple and Android TVs, as well as on Apple and Android phones. Watch us live through YouTube and Facebook.